Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Now that we're starting to enter the final stages of the pandemic, at least in some parts of the world, and things are starting to open up in many areas, I figured it was probably time to go back to our question pile and grab all of those questions that we kind of shoved under the rug because they were involving public play. Now, for the last year and a half, we've gotten a number of questions that I put on hold due to pretty much no one being able to get together and game in person. So tonight, we're bringing those out from the rug. We put them in a pile and we found the oldest question we have that we've had to put on hold. Tonight's question comes from Jennifer, who went to the blog and clicked on Ask the Bellhop to ask, My question involves organizing community events. A few months ago, I saw a local Barnes & Noble advertise a family game night. It ended up being the classic games like Clue, Monopoly, and the like. I was surprised since they do sell modern board games. But it got me thinking about organizing a public event like that. Maybe approaching Barnes and Noble or having it at a library. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for jumping into something like that? A little background on me, I run a small meetup group for board gaming families in Las Vegas. We do private game nights at my house every two weeks, so I am accustomed to meeting strangers and teaching them games, though my skill in both is debatable. Well, thank you so much for the question, Jennifer, and I do apologize for taking so long to get to your question, though I do think in this case the delay is warranted. Now, I want to start off by saying that I think it's awesome. It is fantastic that you want to get involved in organizing public play events, bigger public play events. Gaming in public is by far the best and easiest way to spread this wonderful hobby across the world. And I applaud anyone willing to take the steps to organize and or help out with any type of community event. While I think many people think of Las Vegas as a tourist trap primarily, mm -hmm. I've known many residents there and think it's awesome to hear from Vegas locals. I actually <laughs> considered it as a place to move myself at one point when my company was opening up a location there. So I have a problem whenever I hear Las Vegas, I think of playing Settlers of Catan with my friend Eugene, who every time he builds a city on the desert has to sing, Viva Las Vegas, and then has to sing it every time again, whenever that city actually pays off because everyone makes fun of him for building on the desert. But I can't get that out of my head whenever I hear Las Vegas. Now, I'm also pleased to hear that you have a local Barnes & Noble that at least was doing something, right? They were hosting some kind of game night. Maybe it wasn't the games you wanted to see, but I'd rather see this than no gaming at all. The fact that they already have a place where people can gather together to play games is fantastic. I, I want that to spread. I want more places doing that. Now, this combined with the fact you already run a meetup group means, you know what, you're on the right track. You're, you're, you're a, a lap ahead, many people. Absolutely. And I bet in it's another person just like you, perhaps an employee there at Barnes & Noble, that set up that first one, and they'd probably love help or guidance, mm -hmm. and anything that brings foot traffic into stores like that is usually good for the store too, especially if you can highlight product on their shelves. So what I think I am going to do here, since you already gotten some progress, though, is take a step back. I want to talk about this because there are lots of other people listening besides Jennifer, and I want this to apply to someone just starting from scratch. I think this is going to be more beneficial to more people. Plus, some of the starter advice still may be useful to Jennifer as well. Indeed, you're never too experienced to pick up a few tricks for all those steps along the way. Now, for any community gaming event, you are going to need three things at an absolute minimum. There are also some great nice-to-haves, but we're going to start with the basics. For a public play event to work, you need a place to play, games to play, and people to show up at that place to play those games. Pretty much everything else is icing on the cake, once you have those three basics down. Now, I did cover some of this and aspects of this back on episode 51 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, that was entitled Join the Club, and there was a related blog post called Tips for Starting Your Own Tabletop Gaming Club. Now, that was almost two years ago, so I do think it's worth looking at this topic again, and even comparing what kind of came out of my train of thought while working on the show notes, it's actually a slightly different approach to the whole topic as last time. But if you do want even more information than you hear tonight, feel free to go check out our back catalog or the blog for that post. The first thing you'll need is a place to play. So, Jennifer said they're having strangers at their house, and to me, that's a big no-no. 
Like, I, I honestly think the first thing you should do is drop and forget right away about playing games at your own house. Like, I don't care if you got a nice garage out back that you can fit four by eight gaming tables and fit four of them in there and hold 30 gamers in there. Save that for the people you know and trust, your own personal gaming group. Perhaps people you've met at community gaming events and have gamed with multiple times and have grown to know. Please do not open your own home to the public. I like I love that someone's trusting enough to do that, but there are many reasons for this, including liability issues, bylaws, zoning laws, and fire codes. Then there's the potential people problems, which I don't think we really need to get into here, but I'm sure you can imagine the types of people that might show up to an event that you would want there. Public spaces, especially retail, commercial, and restaurants, have insurance for things that homeowners do not, and for good reason. You want your community event to be at a public place, a place the community can gather. Also, public places are generally going to be more central, which helps a wider range of people get there mm -hmm. or even just stumble upon it and discover it. Now, when looking for a public place, uh, you want a spot that's well lit, accessible. Please be aware that there are people who have mobility issues. Make sure there's ramps, elevators, all that stuff. Has public washrooms. If you're going to be there for an extended period of time, People might need a bio break. There should be a space to play. Like I've had people book places, gaming nights at places and you show up and there's like a standing room only. And it's it's like, there's no all bar seats and no tables. And you, you need to watch to make sure you actually have tables that are large enough to game at and chairs to sit in. You also want somewhere that you can either bring food in and drink in or that provides food and drink in some way. Now, this can be really simple. This could be bottled water, chips, chocolate bars, and snack food, but it does help to have at least something to keep people hydrated and while well, not hungry. You don't want people to have to leave your event to go get food to then maybe decide they don't feel like coming back. Also take th into consideration things like the venue having parking and or being on a public transit route. This could greatly impact your attendance. The easier your venue is to get to, the more people you may get out. Now, I happen to know that at least pre-pandemic, all three of those major Barnes & Noble locations in the Vegas area had Starbucks in them. So that yep. will certainly help with the munchies, hydration, and public restrooms. There you go. Maybe all set. Now, because there is a Barnes & Noble already there hosting a game night, that does seem like a great venue. I, at Barnes & Noble's bookstores are great. Anywhere that sells games is a great choice because you end up with a win-win relationship with the venue. You get a place to host game nights and play games, which hopefully leads to sales for the venue. So bookstores, hobby stores, game stores, they can all be great for public play events. Now, Jennifer also mentions libraries, which I think are a fantastic venue for board gaming, as long as they have a space for it that's out of the way enough that potentially loud gamers won't bother anyone trying to do research and you won't have people coming through that you don't need coming through. I do know like people like Donald Dennis, who's on board games, our walls feel all over the internet is a works for a library and he runs their game nights. Like, so though it does exist and it is out there. So it is definitely worth reaching out to a library. Uh, and a quick Google suggests that Las Vegas libraries are actually quite sizable with free Wi-Fi though they do rent their meeting spaces. So you need to speak with someone there to see how about organize, how to go about organizing public events and uh, if there are charges associated with that. Very true. Now, I've also personally hosted events at cafes, pubs, and restaurants. The thing to watch here is a couple things. One is the lighting. You don't want to be playing Euro games, especially your card games in somewhere with low light. Uh, you can probably get away with a deck of cards, but anytime you're going to be reading anything or having to see symbols on a board, you want bright lights. The other thing is volume level. Now that goes both ways. Most games require concentration, so you don't want to play anywhere too loud. Similarly, some games and gamers can be quite loud themselves, and you don't want to disrupt anything else going on in the venue. So for this reason, you're better if you can to get a dedicated space to gaming instead of sharing a pub with a bunch of people who are going to be there for drinks and food at the same time that you're using up some of the tables to play games. Note, that may not be possible. Note, casinos, for instance, aren't ideal for board gaming, at least not in their public areas. 
Now, though, I do know they do have meeting rooms as well, though I've never considered running an event at the local casino, but I could see it working. The problem with the casino is then you're limiting it to 18 plus or I think even higher in the States, which you don't want to do if you don't have to. And I just unplugged again for potential edit. I don't know why I keep rolling over that cable this week and not other weeks. This is how our innate started. <clears throat> All right. Oh. Another place I found great for hosting game nights are banquet halls and community clubs, things like the Knights of Columbus or the local Legion or various culture clubs like the French Canadian Club or whatever you may have in your area. Now, these venues tend to have large tables for banquets, and they're usually not being used every day on a day-to-day -day basis, so are often very open to having an event that will bring people in during their usual downtime. Now, the one problem I have had with these places that now and then they do get booked for a big event, and that often means the game club needs to get out of the way. You get, you get shoved aside. We had that problem with people having midweek weddings at one of our local venues. The other thing you do have to watch for with this is how exclusive these groups are. You want to have your public play event in a place that is welcoming to gamers of all ages, walks of life, and social status. Some of these private clubs can be more welcoming than others, and I'll just leave it at that, but we have had this problem locally. Another issue is that while in a post-pandemic world, there may be places desperate to do anything to bring people in, and as such, very welcoming to gamers, but mm -hmm. once business picks up again, they may be all too happy to turf the gamers for those they see as more profitable. Now, one trick to that is just make sure that the gamers that are with you do actually support the venue and make it so it's profitable for you to be there. Now, as for actually booking a venue, right, like doing the work, it generally just means talking to the right person. Uh, make sure you talk to a manager, not just a person on staff, and sell the idea to them. Let the venue know how many people you expect. This is where things like Meetup and Facebook events are good for getting a, a rough idea of how many people will be attending and what you expect them to get out of it. So if your gamers are coming, are they going to spend money and what are they going to spend money on? Like is, if it's a restaurant, are you going to make it a long enough event where you expect everyone to show up and eat dinner first and then move on to gaming? Or is it just going to be the case of people ordering apps while they play? Keep the food and game separate. We've talked about this many times. Side tables. Now, if a game store offer, offers to have an event, are they going to offer their game library? Do they have demo games? Do they have specific games they want to sell so that you can highlight those games? Or will they? are they willing to run demos? Like here, I'll host an event, but if you want to show off some games, you're welcome to you know use our people to show off your games. Now, for a cafe, we have had this before as a drink minimum where people have to buy whatever, one coffee every couple hours, or they have to at least buy something for a set amount of time. Now, one of the deals I made in the past that actually worked really well is there was a place that basically charged me a deposit. I gave them a set amount of money at the beginning of the event, but if people, the gamers, spent enough money, I got that back. I never lost my deposit every time people spent enough money. And I thought that was a good, but they, they want to minimize their risk, right? They don't want a bunch of people using up their tables for four to six hours and getting nothing out of it. Now, another thing you can do is charge people to attend the event. And then you could take some or all of those proceeds and give it to the venue. This is going to work better for a place that doesn't have any food to offer or anything they're trying to sell. Now, if you do have an agreement like this, make sure the gamers know, make sure people know that, hey, support the venue. That I say this every time I'm talking about public play events. Support the venue. Make sure people are spending money and not sneaking in their own drinks and not being cheap. And remind people that, like, hey, we're gathered together. We're providing games. This is a service that is valuable to you, so please pay it back. So make sure they know that. I've got to say, over the years, i found most places. I'm more than happy to have a bunch of gamers there, especially if they have a slow day. And a game night can fill that gap. Like some of the biggest events in Canada actually happen at Boston Pizzas. That's not something we do here locally, but Ottawa is filled with these Boston Pizza gaming events that are midweek when Boston Pizza is not busy. All right. Well, something I really recommend, as well as meeting in person, uh, which helps making sure you're talking to someone who actually can make mm. such decisions, like the manager, and not just a friendly employee, <laughs> but also follow up by email. Get mm -hmm. an agreement in writing. It may or may not have any value in a legal sense, but it can help clarify and remind people involved as yeah. well as potentially spot any gotchas you had missed in your discussions. 
Yeah, I've always negotiated in good faith, and in all the years I've done this, we have had one problem with a venue come up that, that didn't uphold their end of the bargain. So we just don't go there anymore. Now, one thing you do need to consider that's like a sit down either by yourself or if you're doing this with someone else, have this discussion, is if you are going to be at a venue that allows adult beverages, you basically can't really stop people from ordering adult beverages if you're at like a restaurant that serves them. Um, and if adult beverage will be allowed at the event, this is a personal choice. Um, what you need to be aware of is at least in Canada, and I don't know if this is true everywhere else, if you are hosting an event and someone has too much to drink and then causes a problem, uh, you're liable because it was your event, not the venue, you, the organizer of the event is liable. So I a big one. So you need to, to deal with that. You need to be aware of that. And you have to worry about people driving vehicles and stuff like that. Then you also have to deal with people who may not be able to handle their drinks and people who get rowdy and everything else that comes with it so you're looking at two very different types of events if you allow drinking and you just need to make that decision now one of the things i found worked really well locally for not having to worry about that is having your events at like noon early in the afternoon at a public play place because in most cases people aren't getting hammered at noon but it is still something that could happen so this is a a, a big thing that could impact your choice of venue now, if you are going to have adult beverages, I actually recommend looking into your region's alcohol server training, just so you're aware of what to look out for and some guidance on dealing with those who may be overdoing it. In mm -hmm. Ontario, it's called Smart Serve, but that will vary by jurisdiction. What it is, it's just a training to understand how to recognize people who are over imbibing and things. It's meant for servers, but it's really beneficial for organizers as well. So now that you found a place, you're going to need games to play. Now, if you're playing at a game store or cafe or Barnes & Noble who happens to sell games, maybe you're lucky enough to have demo copies on hand. But in most cases and for most places, you're going to have to bring the games or someone's going to have to bring the games. While it's possible you can rely on others to provide games as the host for a public play event, I strongly recommend building up a small library at least of games on hand that you bring to every event. Now, for every public play event, you want a mix of games and game types, both in regards to weight and player count, as well as familiarity, stuff people will recognize. I really do recommend having some of those mass market favorites on hand. And, of course, some well-known gateway hobby games to try to shift people towards the hobby side of things. Because as hobby gamers, which you wouldn't be listening to me right now if you weren't a hobby gamer, we tend to forget that board game night to many people means something very different than it does for us. People who happen to see an ad in the paper or walk by a store that says game night are looking for a night out to have some fun and play something simple, lightweight and party games. The kind of games we talked about last week during our topic of ultralight games or a couple weeks back when we talked about filler games. They're looking for light laughing fun, not necessarily sitting there trying to do a spreadsheet in their head and figure out which stocks they should buy in an 18xx game. So you may get those gamers too. Yeah, having Clue or something people instantly recognize mm -hmm. can really make them feel more comfortable uh, if they're not used to hobby games. And then once they're comfortable, that's when you can get them interested and lure them in over to the mm -hmm. expensive side. So the most popular gaming cafe, as far as I know, in the world is Snakes and Lattes in Toronto that is now spread out to like three other countries. It's, it's kind of bananas how far they've gotten with this. And the one thing the owner quickly learned and used to point out all the time is that their most popular games are still, you know, Monopoly, Clue, Jenga, and other social games. The, these are big, heavy gamers that hire people just to teach games to other people, and constantly people come in and are looking to play mass market favorites. That is what you're going to get at a public gaming event. To me, it's an opportunity. Blow their minds, show them something new, but have those games they're comfortable with there. Like, I'm not saying avoid hobby games altogether, right? Like, please, please spread the love of Euro games with the world, but just make sure you have some of the lighter stuff. Like, at our personal events, the most played game at our events we host downtown over the years has been, guess who? It's just a matter of having it out on the table. People who aren't really comfortable and don't know anyone else are going to pick it up and play it between themselves. And then as they see other people having fun, hopefully they get to mingle. Sometimes they just sit there all night and play guess who, and then come back a couple weeks later and try something different. Like, honestly, these are events I run with most a bunch of local gamers. Guess who's the most played games? 
Speaking of which, you should also base the games on the venue. Where, guess who is most popular, is a place called Villain's Bistro, which is a geeky cafe and bar. It, it's a, a, a bistro, right? Um, guess who was huge there? I don't bring guess who to the local game store. What you're bringing should be based on the venue. If you're playing in a dedicated gaming area, you also have to watch for things like table size. And you might want to avoid games with lots of little components that are easily lost. The games I bring to a pub like Villains Vistro are very different from the games I would bring to a dedicated gaming space. Now, if you are playing at a bookstore, for instance, use their terms. Maybe it's family strategy games rather than hobby games. Mm. Retail locations will love you for anything you can do to help move their product. And if people come in to buy a paperback, play a few games and walk out with a copy of King of Tokyo, mm -hmm. everybody wins. Totally agree. Now, another thing you do have to watch for is the tone of the games you are bringing. Uh, personally, I not only refuse to bring any of the popular not safe for work board games to any event I'm hosting, I also ban anyone else bringing them. You don't want anyone playing anything that may offend someone else. And I'm not talking countercultural, easily offended people. I'm talking about making game night fun and not saying something inappropriate well to someone else who happens to be playing or just at the venue. You got to think about the fact that you're not just gamers there at some of these places. There could be kids present. There will be diverse people around. You. Similarly, you probably want to avoid games with controversial themes. You and everyone else is welcome to enjoy these games in the privacy of your own homes. I'm not judging you there. But there are plenty of other games to play that are much better for public play gaming events. Yeah, in this case, even if they do sell those games at the store and Barnes & Noble does carry mm -hmm. Cards Against Humanity, just because they sell it doesn't mean they or anyone else wants it played at the store. Now, once you have a number of games ready for events, perhaps even a core set of games you always bring, that's when you can start encouraging other people to bring games. At all of the gaming events I run, I call them open gaming events. I welcome anyone to bring the games they want. And, well, all, not all of them because of those games I just mentioned. But bring most of the games they want. And the more people that bring games, the more options there are. And what I have found is most of the people willing to bring games are excited about the games they're bringing and willing to teach them and excited to share them with other people. So they take a load off you by being ambassadors of their own and teaching the games. Yeah. That being said, if a bookstore didn't want people bringing in games, True. it would also be understandable. If things get busy, it's unfortunately all too easy to strip the shrink off a box on the shelf and add it to your collection. Should someone choose to ruin it for everyone. You're giving people ideas here. That's not good. No, but it's true. That, that uh, I am assuming they're good with you bringing games. Now, if a local game store is letting you have an event and only lets you play with their demo games or Barnes & Nobles has a bunch of game night copies, um, all I would do is try to encourage them to have enough variety in those games. And I honestly would probably look for, excuse me, honestly, I would probably look for another venue eventually if they were that sticky about it. So now that you got a place and games, you need people. Now, Jennifer noted they already run meetups. So that is a great place to find gamers. Though I personally found the service a little limited as a free app, the paid version, um, you need it early in your, your, once your group grows past a certain size, you pretty much have to go for the paid version. Now, if you are charging for your game night, maybe that can offset that cost. But personally, it's something I haven't used. Uh, Facebook events are great for finding adult gamers. No, nope, kids are not on Facebook, despite what you may think. Um, Board Game Geek is a great place to find gamers. If you are looking for other alpha gamers, only really alpha gamers are going to be on Board Game Geek. People are already, you, you, have, you have a vested audience there, right? And they have a forum for every state in every province possibly even broken down by city depending on where you are for us in windsor ontario we're stuck with the ontario forum but once i start running events i post in there every event we're going to have and have met some awesome local gamers through board game Geek. now if your event's free the other thing you do is reach out to local media newspapers bloggers um there are there are so many windsor news sites now run by independents reach out to all those people and be like hey and look a lot of those online ones have event sections where you can submit local events and community calendars. Now, some of those will charge money, but usually if your event is free, they don't. So that's why I suggest if you have a free event doing this. This is a great way to get the word out. 
Now, as for sending an official press release, which is also something worth doing, this is worth doing if you have a new event that started up or if you have a big event, like if we talked a few weeks ago about um, running board game tournaments or something like our Extra Life 24-hour charity gaming. That is the kind of thing where we might actually send out a press release. We'll go on the news. I've been on TV before talking about it. Now, it's old school, but something that actually we found works rather well is putting up posters and flyers. Uh, both at the venue you're going to be using, but also at places gamers like to hang out. Game stores, comic shops, coffee shops, the local university. You can also look to put up something online. If you are playing at a specific venue and they have a web page, ask them to list your event there. Now, once things get started, word of mouth will probably be your best way to get the word out. And while the goal of that is just make sure it's a fun game night. There are many meeting group planner websites and software out there. We couldn't possibly cover mm. them all. But as a local, you're probably already aware of what is in use in your region already. Mm -hmm. And it's best to work with what's already established than to try and get people to use a new platform, which they are generally hesitant to uh, sign up with. And these new platforms show up every week. I can't believe how many apps are out there now to find gamers. And I'm like, go to the place people are already using, right? <laughs> Try to find what's most popular. So now we got the basics. We got a place. We got gamers. We're filling that people with, play, with, with, with people to play the games. So here are some further tips and things you want to have in place. Maybe not for your first event, but these are the kind of things you want to get in place as soon as you can. These are things that are going to make the game night fun or more fun, and this is the kind of thing where that word of mouth is going to spread. You're going to get people excited about your events. There are uh, <clears throat> the icing on the cake, a game night, uh, the icing on the game night cake, as it were. Sean got distracted. All right, so I'm talking about fun and excitement. This really isn't a fun and exciting thing to talk about, but it's something important. If you run a local event, a public event, you should have a harassment policy and communicate it well. Have this posted somewhere, have a copy on each table, have it posted online, have a sign in sheet at the start of the event, everyone's going to get a copy. Make sure everyone knows it, has read it, perhaps even getting people to sign it to show that they've read and agreed to it. While this may seem over the top, harassment policies do the opposite of what people think. We're not trying to exclude people, they actually make your game nights more accessible, more open and more safe. They let people know that your event will be a safe place and what to do if it becomes unsafe for them. With this, you can and should also provide safety tools. Have an open door policy. What that means is if anyone is uncomfortable, they can get up and walk away from the table for any reason. Make sure any games that need them include tools like the X card. Now, yes, this is generally an RPG-based tool, and we've already said avoid the controversial games, but this can apply to some board games as well as role-playing games. Remember, this is all about getting together and having fun. And you want to stomp out anything that could ruin this fun for anyone else. Now, aside from rules about interpersonal issues, depending on your location, there could also be an additional set of rules specifically about the staff and product. Mm -hmm. If you're in a store, restaurant, or even library, if the store is providing demo copies of games, for instance, people need to know they can't just grab one off the shelf and open it up to play Mm -hmm. If someone is using the, the demo copy, it sounds like something rid ridiculous, but it pays to anticipate just how ridiculous some people can be. Now, along with this, you should have some general ground rules as well. It shouldn't all just be about the th things that could go wrong. Like who's going to bring the games? Um, indicate who, who puts it away? Who puts away a game at the end of playing with it? And make sure everyone knows to put it back the way you found it. I hate when I blend my games out and I bring them home and I go to play and there's all the baggies are there and all the dividers are there, but everything's just dumped in the box. Please take care of other people's games. Uh, you should have rules for food and drink. Again, I say keep them separate. Eating, drinking away from the games, especially when you're playing someone else's games. Remove the possibility of spills or greasy fingers completely if you can. Drinks on side tables, separate tables, or have an eating area that's separate from the playing area. Now, this isn't a tournament or anything. Well, I guess it could be, but in general, for a, for a general public play thing. So you don't need, like, a group-wide start player rule, though maybe you want one. You just want to cover common things that are come up on game night. Who's responsible for cleaning up? Where do the games go? How do you indicate who owns what game so someone doesn't take the wrong thing? What happens if someone actually damages someone else's game and so on? 
Now, this could be an ephemeral social contract, but I honestly think this should be right there with your harassment policy and written down somewhere. Like, at least post it online. If you're using some kind of event service, have it in the description of the event. You want it so these are easily communicated to someone showing up for the first time as well. And no, these should be living and change over time. As new things come up and the group grows, you're going to find you need to add some rules in and maybe some take out, take some out. A simple sign-in sheet that has the rules right there to be read and agreed to is also a good way to help if you need to enforce them and possibly build up a contact list for future events. It's true. Now, I am assuming Jennifer wants to host these nights and be involved in it through the whole night. You need someone to do that. It doesn't necessarily need to be the person who started everything. And I get it. The main goal of building a public play event is to get together and play games. Someone at the event, though, should also be playing host, perhaps instead of playing games, just playing host. This person should greet everyone who arrives, explain what the group rules are, again, including that harassment policy, and work with people to facilitate games getting played. If people show up while all everyone else is already playing something, maybe you have a system where you set them up with a solo or low player count game to play until other tables open up. Watching for games ending soon, encouraging people to swap things up and game with other people. One of the big advantages of being at a public play event is to play with different people. If there's a group that plays together by themselves all the time, now don't bug them every week. If that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do, but do encourage people to mix it up. You also will have to have someone that's willing to deal with all the issues that come up, which is very important to work with the venue. You don't want to overstep anyone's bounds. Uh, there are definitely like certain people are allowed to do certain things in different establishments. Uh, this also goes for setting up the venue, something that's not in the notes here that I want to throw in. Don't just start moving tables. Ask. It may be a liability issue. They may need to get their own staff to move tables, stuff like that. Don't rearrange the whole place without permission. Um, that's one of the things. You also, as, as the host, should be trying to make sure people are having fun and answering any questions. Now, personally, I tend to mix this with gaming. But what I always do is make sure the people I'm sitting down to play with know that I'm hosting primarily. I am here to host this event, and I might have to get up and pause the game to greet someone or facilitate a new game or even sit down and teach a game. Now, as your game group grows and you get a number of regulars, hopefully you can start sharing this hosting duty, perhaps having different people responsible for different things or rotating who plays host each time. Always know who your venue contact is in case of problems. You don't want to try and deal with a problem and not know who you're supposed to be talking to right then. The manager that you agreed with uh, all, on everything with might not be there that night. Yeah. Now, as for getting people gaming together, there are some tools you can use to help facilitate this. These are things that I did not have when I started off with my public play events that I've learned from various cons that I've gone to. So one of them is to have a list of all the games present whether it's in a binder or whatever, or have a central area where people know to find the games they can play. Now, with that, you also do have to get the permission of people who brought games to put their games in a central area. Some people would want to hoard them themselves, and that's where a list can be even better. Just then make sure the list includes who to talk to if someone wants to play those games. Now, another is some way to indicate a couple things. So one is a group or person is looking for more players. So I've got this game as a four-player game. I want to play it. How do I let the group know I need people to play without disrupting everyone? Also, hey, I really want to try this game, but I don't know what I need someone to teach a game. Those are two core ones. Now, this can be done with signs. I've seen some really great table signs that have been done for that that just say looking for player, looking for teacher. Um, personally, I haven't gotten that far locally because our events aren't quite that big, but I've used small traffic cones. And what it is, is if you're looking for players, you put a traffic cone on your table while you're setting up the game and flipping through the rules, and that indicates to people that they need to come over. Now, there is a bit of a learning curve here because it took forever to get people to start putting the cones off the table once they started playing, but it's just something you should do. Uh, the other one that I saw, and I had never seen this until going to Queen City Conquest, is people will grab a game they want to play, put it above their head, and walk around the room. I learned that that means, hey, I'm looking for people to play this game. And I'm like, you know what? That's a really good non-visual, well, sorry, visual, non-verbal cue that works really well. Now, I have been to events that go, hey, this game's starting in half an hour. Do you want players? Depending on your venue, that might work as well. When we have a smaller group together, like 10, 12 people, I'll usually do that. Or I'll just go ask people like, hey, your game's wrapping up. We're about to start a game of this. Anyone want to get in on that before we start? So just have some way to communicate. 
I want to play something. I need more people. I need to teach. Those are the big ones. Yeah, whatever you choose, this can be something else you put a little guide to at sign-in. Yes. Need a player? Cone on head. Need a game? Red Clown knows. Okay, maybe not those specifically, but something established as uh, as a standard. There you go. Everyone who's not playing has clown noses. Well, I get the like blinking Rudolph one, so it's really obvious. Like you, you're not playing anything. Yeah, getting people to do that. Maybe at one of those drinking events, you can get away with that one. Now, another thing you really would like to have, uh, it's its not necessary, but it will really help, is to have people on hand who are skilled at teaching games. This is a huge bonus for game night. I know people who go out to public play game nights to learn to play games they bought themselves that they don't want to take the time to learn to play. This is their the main thing they get out of coming to my gaming nights is to have someone teach them to play a game so they can go home and play it on their own. Now, Jennifer noted they have some experience in this, and it is something you will get better at over time. We have multiple episodes on teaching games. Feel free to go back to the back catalog. There's so many, I'm not even going to call them all out. The more game teachers you have, though, the better. Now, to help with this, I strongly suggest finding teaching guides and game summaries off places like Board Game Geek and Esoteric Order of Gamers. I find these online, print them off, and then place them into the box for any games and bring out the public play events. That way, even if I can't teach the game myself, there's a tool right there in the box to help someone else learn the game. Now, we live in the future, as far as I'm concerned, and there is awesome stuff out there as long as you have internet. And nowadays, who doesn't have a cell phone? Someone at the game table probably has a cell phone, and there is a great way to bring up Watch It Played, Gaming Rules, Rattle Rums Through, or your favorite board game teacher. As long as someone has a cell phone, there's always someone on hand to teach the game. That is something we did not have when I started this in 2002, and it's a great resource. Though I find people forget. They don't think of it. So, like, people, I, I've been at a, a board game blitz tournament, and people are like, we're waiting for you to teach the game. I'm like, why don't you just bring up a Rado? They're like, oh, great, yeah. So that way they just put it out. One person happened to have a tablet in their bag, and they all sat and watched it. It was great. Now, as well as teaching, a little sheet detailing everything that should be in the box and perhaps where, if it's some sort of form of organization, is helpful when it's over and people are putting things away. And, of course, we've already figured out who's putting it away, right? We agreed to that. Yes, that was one of the agreements. There are some great rules out there for who's putting away the game, I got to say. I, I particularly, personally, in a public play event, I think everyone who's playing should work together to do so. You should all help Aggie and put everything away. If you're not sure how to put a game away, find out who the owner is and ask. Don't just guess. Um, but I also really like the rule that the loser puts the game away or the opposite, the winner. So, yeah, you won. You're awesome, but you get to put the game away. So I, I do like both of those. Where did I go? Got that. So as your club grows, it can also be advantageous to have a game library, like a game club. Like I, I told you, this is kind of based on like you want publicly events. You want a... a set of games for that group of people some form of central resource of games that players can borrow games from now this could be just for use on game nights because i'm assuming game nights are regular right they're they're once a week once a month or whatever but this could also stretch to be a resource that's available for people to use on off nights now if possible you want this to be hosted at the venue this is for a number of reasons including the fact that a game collection can take up a lot of space so someone has to have the room to do it the fact that if it's in a central place, no one's going to argue about who gets to host it. And the fact that if the person who owns the collection can't show up, what do you do? If you're charging people to attend your event, growing a collection is a great way to spend that money and reinvest it into, into this public play event. The other option is if you don't can't keep it at the venue, consider splitting up the, the, the collection among multiple members. Again, to make it seem more fair, and second, so that if, again, one member can't make it, someone else can still bring their part of the collection. Also, while there is a wealth of gaming stores around, not all have the ability to have gaming in store. You might even be able to partner with a game store at mm -hmm. a separate venue and let them supply, store, maintain demo games. Now, while I already mentioned that I make sure to keep all of my game nights as open game nights, that way, people are always welcome to bring and show off the new hotness, right? What they're excited about. I, I don't want to shut that down. I don't want to shut down some other gamers' excitement that they just got this game they want to share. I still like to have a theme for every one of our game nights. 
what this does is it helps people focus on what games to bring for those of us that do have a collection. So it's like, all right, I have too many games to pick from. I don't know what to bring tonight. Where if I go, we're going to do pirate games. I can go, well, I only own 10 pirate games. I can only fit about three of them in this box. What three pirate games? I That's just easier. The other thing it can do is it can help drum up excitement for the event. So it's not just every game that's the same. It's open gaming. People have no idea what to expect. They're going to go in and like, oh yeah, there'll be the stuff from the game store and Steve will bring this and John will bring this. And then I don't know what Mo will bring. You know what? Let's skip it this week. There's, there's nothing. We're not going to miss anything. Whereas having a theme, people tend to get more invested. Like I'm not going out to play games. I'm going out to play a new pirate theme game and I'm going to get dressed up and I'm, I'm going to wear an eye patch while I play. It honestly does really help keep people invested by giving people the reason to come to that night, not just come to every night. And of course, you can try to work with your venue to match up. Barnes & Noble, perhaps they do a product display to match your theme. Mm. Maybe a restaurant could even have a special that night, even if it's actually just their usual special, with a fun <laughs> theme name the servers know. That's a cool idea, actually. Do you see that at game cons? If you, if you go to um, Barley's, which is a, a, I don't know, brew pub, I guess, uh, that's right near the convention center in, at Origins. They have two menus. They have the Origins menu and the regular menu, and they're actually identical, but everything has fantasy names. All right, my final suggestion, and to be honest, this is a, a strong, probably the strongest suggestion. This is, you're probably stuck at the beginning, but this is one of the quickest things you want to do. You don't want to do it all yourself. This is the trap I fell into early in the Windsor Gaming Resource Days. Once you have some regulars at your game night, talk to them and see if they're willing to volunteer to help out in some way. While it's admirable and appreciated that Jennifer and others like them want to start hosting a gaming night, they shouldn't have to do it all on their own. Just because someone starts something doesn't mean they have to be the only one doing it forever. Similarly, if you're in a game club or you attend public play events, I encourage you to offer to help out. Now, this can come in all kinds of forms. Maybe someone's online all the time, so they can run a group social media account, keep everyone aware, and maybe drum up interest. Someone may have a huge game collection, so they become in charge of bringing the core games every night or maybe setting the theme. Someone who's active on Board Game Geek can be in charge of posting there, getting into the local group and posting once a week. Or they could set up the... Uh, the private forum or a blog on board game geek to get the words out if you've got a student in your group someone who attends a local college or university maybe they can help finding new gamers by putting the word out on campus if you've got a baker in the group maybe there's someone willing to make snacks for everyone every week possibly even turning this into a side hustle and selling cupcakes at your game night we gamers are a talented lot use that use that to your advantage and benefit and benefit everyone who takes part in your community gaming event. Make your community gaming event a community event. Now, one thing I know about Las Vegas is that there are a lot of event professionals based mm -hmm. there. Folks who know a lot about organizing things. Now, they may not want to take on a big job on their time off, but they might be willing to help here and there and offer their advice and knowledge mm -hmm. to benefit your events. Well, that's it for our discussion on starting up and organizing a community gaming event. Now, remember, if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, all you got to do is head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.